Welcome to California Community Church and welcome to Christmas at California Community Church. This month we are celebrating Jesus and it is an honor to be a part of your lives. Thank you for being a part of this church experience. We're talking about something that everybody needs and that no one can exist without and it's the topic of hope. We've been talking about it all month and today we're going to take on the topic of how do you have hope when God messes up your plans? You know, if you think about that first Christmas, plans were being messed up all over the place. When Jesus Christ was born that first Christmas, nobody expected it. Totally not in anybody's five-year plan. It messed up everything people thought their life would be like. Think about King Herod. He thought that he was secure in his monarchy, and then he's told that the king of the Jews had been born, and it was very disruptive and upsetting to him. Think about the shepherd's plan. They thought they'd have just another night on a hillside with the sheep and things would go as they had gone night after night after night. But anything but that is what happened. It messed up the religious leaders' plans because they were expecting a political messiah, somebody who would come with governmental and military power to overthrow the heavy hand of Rome on the backs of the Jewish people. But then Jesus comes along and says things like, turn the other cheek or go the second mile or love your enemy. Wasn't anything like they expected, and their plans were upset. The innkeeper, he's turning away people in the night. It's not at all what he planned. And Joseph and Mary were two of the people that didn't have a room in the inn that night. But most of all, it did mess up Joseph and Mary's plans. They were a young couple, barely teenagers. All they wanted to do was get married and then have tiny little Josephs and Marys and have a normal life. In their wedding preparation, during their engagement period, all of a sudden God comes and he says to them, I am going to change the plan. And the angel said to Mary and Joseph, three things are going to happen. And these three things were very disruptive. First, Mary, you're going to get pregnant before your wedding day. Second, Joseph, you're going to be the stepfather, not the father. It's going to be a virgin birth. It's going to be a miracle unlike anything that's ever happened. And number three, by the way, the baby's going to be God. Well, that messed up their plans a little bit. They weren't expecting any of that. Let me ask you a question. Has God ever messed up your plans? Some of you know parts of my story. When I was in high school, my plan was I was going to leave high school, go to Indiana University. There I was going to study law enforcement, and I had a career path charted out into the state police and hopefully one day into the United States Secret Service. That's what I wanted. That's what I planned. I had it mapped out. That's the direction I was going to go until God began to tug at my heart and circumstances of my life began to show me that what God wanted from my life was for me to serve him as a teacher, a communicator, and as a leader. And I've been doing that with churches now all of my career. Some of you have had your plans messed up this past year specifically in a lot of ways. Some of you have had unexpected tragedy this year. My family has. Some of you had travel plans, family celebrations disrupted and changed by the circumstances of this year. My family has too. Karen, my wife, had a significant birthday this past year, and we had major plans to celebrate her all month long. This was back in May. And almost none of those plans were able to happen because of the pandemic. So I bought Karen a t-shirt that says, COVID ruined my birthday. I bet you've had plans ruined because of COVID. Things happen all the time that we don't expect. Now, I'm not saying that everything that changes in your life, all the disruptions of your life come from God. That's actually not the truth. God is not the author of evil as an example. If somebody gets robbed, God wasn't responsible for that. If somebody gets COVID, God's not responsible for that. He doesn't plan that. If somebody gets abused or somebody gets cancer, the Bible tells us clearly God is good, and he's not the author of evil. That's why we're to pray for his will to be done on earth, because his will is not always done. The fact is, a lot of my plans get messed up because I mess them up. I mean, can I get an amen? 
Can anybody else relate to that? My own stupidity at times has messed up some of my plans. We're all very well acquainted with how we can mess ourselves up. And we're all very well acquainted how other people can mess up our plans. But that's not what I want to focus on today. Instead, I want to focus on the times when, in fact, it is God who messes up your plans. Where God providentially, in his sovereignty, changes the circumstances of your life because God has another idea in mind. And that's obviously what happened that first Christmas 2,000 years ago. What do you do when God messes up your plan, those situations that are out of your control? And let's just admit, it does happen. When God messes up your plans, what's going on? What does it mean when God messes up our plans? Well, let's take a look. Here's number one. When God messes up our plans, God is saying, I am trying to get your attention. I am trying to get your attention. In Joseph and Mary's case, God's disruption to their lives was so outlandish, so fantastic, a once-in-history kind of event, the heavens split open and an angel comes and speaks to them God's disruptive plan. I mean, God really wanted to make sure he had their attention. Joseph, this is what's going to happen. Mary, this is what's going to happen. I am coming to earth as a human being, and you too get to help raise me. Now that angel was a major disruptive force. Why would God be so disruptive? Because he didn't want them to miss it. He didn't want them to miss it. God wanted their attention. This is why God can't always talk to us in a whisper. Sometimes he does. This is why God can't always talk to us in the normal course of our lives. Sometimes he does. But sometimes, because we're not listening, God has to be disruptive. It's because we have what I call ADD, attention deity disorder. We're not always listening to God. We've got our heads filled and our ears filled and our minds and hearts filled with all kinds of other stuff. We don't have time to listen to God. So God says, I'm going to readjust your plans. I'm going to disrupt and mess with your plans so that you do have time to listen to me. Look what God says. I wish my people would listen to me. Now, why does God want to get your attention? Because it will spare you a lot of pain in your life. We get ourselves into all kinds of trouble when we don't do what God tells us to do. Look what the scripture tells us. There's a path before each person that seems right, but that path... What we think is right ends in death. You've seen this. A lot of things look really good on the front end. When you get to the back end, it's just a disaster. It's a dead end. Have you ever had a time in your life you thought, I know I'm making the right decision. This is guaranteed. This is a surefire success. And then when it actually comes to pass, it's an unmitigated failure, total disaster. We've all had plans that fell apart. And why is that? Mainly because we can't see the future. We can't see what's over the next hill or around that next corner. That's why God says, I want you to listen to me. Because God does know the future. He's able to see over that next hill and around that next corner. He can see the roadblocks. He can see the potholes. He can see the wrecks that you can avoid if you'd only listen to him. In the Bible, there's many things, many times where God says, if you'll do these things, you're going to have a good life. If you do these things, you're going to have a meaningful, significant life. But there's also a list where he says, if you do these things over here, you're going to have a lot more worry. You're going to have a lot more pain. You're going to have a lot more broken relationships. Your life's going to be unfulfilling and unsatisfactory. Do these things and live. Do these things and it's a dead end. When he tells us what to do and he tells us what not to do, he's not trying to be a bully. He's not trying to be a dictator. He loves you and he wants you to live the life that he created you to live. And sometimes we get so entrenched in our plans and our circumstances and our ways that we're not listening to God. So he starts pulling those plans apart so that we have headspace heart space, ear space, to listen to what God wants to tell us. 
Here's the second thing that happens when God messes up our plans. When God messes them up, he's saying, I have a better plan. I have a better plan. We talk about this a lot at California Community Church. The Bible says very clearly that God has a plan and God has a purpose for every single purpose person. You were made on purpose and you were made for a purpose. God designed you uniquely, and he wants your life to be significant and be fulfilling. And if we start living his purposes for our life, all that he intended for us suddenly starts to happen in our life. I taught about finding God's purposes for your life just recently at our church. Over several weeks, we covered that topic extensively, and you can find that on our website, and you can listen to those messages for yourself. But look at this. I know what I'm planning for you, says the Lord. I have good plans for you, not plans to hurt you. I'll give you hope, and I'll give you a good future. Look at that word hope. Look at that phrase, good future. God says, my plans for your life are actually good. See, this is different from what a lot of people think. Some people think, man, if I start following Jesus with my life, I'm not going to have fun anymore. I'm going to be boring. People aren't going to invite me to their house or their parties. I'm going to have to end up being some weird kind of person. And God says, no, 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 you don't understand. I made you. I love you. I designed you for a purpose here on earth. Let me tell you something about God's plan for your life. God's plan for your life is always going to be bigger than your plans for your life. Why is that? Because God has a bigger perspective. Because God can see it all. Because God knows what you're capable of far more than you know what you're capable of. And God knows all that he wants to do in you. And it's bigger than you can possibly imagine. Joseph and Mary's plans, not a bad plan. We're going to get married. We're going to go back to Nazareth. I'm going to set up a carpentry shop. We're going to have, you know, 2.7 kids or whatever. We're just going to have a normal life. That's fine. But God said, I have more for you than that. I'm going to use your life to bless the entire world. If you don't get anything else that I say today, you need to understand that God made you for a purpose, and you have no idea how much God wants to work through your life, how much he could do through your life if you were totally committed to his plan. You say, God, whatever it is you want from me, whatever it is you have planned for me, I want it all. I want everything that you have planned for my life and just watch what God begins to do in your life. God's plans are always going to be bigger. Here's the second part, and this one's a little tougher, but I want you to hang in here with me. God's God's plan for your life is always harder than your plan for your life. I think this is why a lot of people stop following Jesus. I mean, humans being humans, we just want the easy way. We want the path of least resistance. And God says, I'm not interested in making it easy. As a matter of fact, God is more interested in your character than he is in your comfort. And think about that. If you have too much comfort, it actually diminishes the development of your character. God wants you to grow up. He wants me to be mature. He wants us to be people of integrity and character and responsibility. And so he's in no way going to take all the problems out of our life. Following Jesus is not easy. He never promised it would be easy. He only promised it would be possible. And he also promised that if we followed him, it would develop within us the characteristics, the character traits of Jesus Christ. If all the problems were removed from your life, you'd be a spoiled brat. I mean, if you got everything that you ever wanted all the time, you'd be worthless. Nobody would be able to live with you. You'd be a whiny little brat. So God says you've got to go through the hard because it makes you mature. It makes you responsible. It makes you grow up. When Mary and Joseph said, okay, God, we're going to cooperate with you. Whatever you want from our life, use us. And then did their life get easier? No, their life actually got harder. Now Mary has to face everybody as an unwed mother. And back in those days, the gossip would have been terrible. I mean, who's going to believe her story? Oh, yeah, the the baby is God's, right? And then at the end of Mary's pregnancy, she didn't have her mother around when her firstborn was, was delivered. She didn't have a grandmother or aunts and uncles around to comfort her or help her with that newborn baby. No, she's in another city and she's in a barn 
of all the ways that God could have shown himself to human beings. I mean, he could have just broken through the sky and God could have appeared and everybody would have been made to pay attention. But God said, no, I'm just going to take the heart away. I'm going to start out as a little baby. But God had a purpose for that because nobody's afraid of a baby. But then God had that baby born in a barn and That's about as lowly and as hard of a beginning in life as you could have. Why in the world did God do that? Because Jesus Christ grew up to say, following me is going to cost you. Following me is not the easy way, but it's the most significant way in your life. That's what it's all about. God's plan is going to be bigger. It's going to be harder. And look at this third part. God's plan for your life is always more rewarding than your plan. And I like this point. Let me give you a verse that's quickly becoming my favorite verse in the whole Bible. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. Look what it says. No one has ever seen or heard or even imagined what wonderful things God has ready for those who love him. When you cooperate with God's plan for your life, you have two benefits, significance and satisfaction. Two things that everybody's looking for. You get rewarded with the two things that everybody wants. If you get to spend 50, 60, 70, 80, or 90 years on this planet, that's going to be something. But at the end of that, guess what? We all die. And then there's eternity. We're going to spend way more time in eternity than we ever spend here on earth. And here's the question. Will you have used your time here on earth to get to know God? He wants you to. Will you have used your time here on earth to live God's purposes for your life? He wants you to. Can you imagine standing before God at the front end of eternity and God says, I just want to ask you two questions. What did you do with my son, Jesus Christ? Did you get to know him? Did you place your faith in him? Did you trust him as your savior? And then the second question is, did you live my purposes for your life? Can you imagine saying to God, well, God, you know, I knew about you, but I was just too busy to really get to know you. And, and, You know, I knew you had a plan for my life, but I kind of liked my plan a little better than your plan, so I just decided to do my own thing. Hope that's okay. It's going to be more than an embarrassment that day. That answer to those questions will have eternal implications. That's why Christmas is so important. God says, I came to earth because I want you to know me. I came to earth to show you the way, to show you what I'm about so that you can make that the purpose of your life, so you can be about what I'm about. When we do that, the rewards of that are out of this world. Let's jump to the third and final point of the message today. When God disrupts our plans, God is saying, I want you to learn to trust me. Can you imagine the faith that it took for Joseph to do what God asked him to do? I mean, if your fiancé came to you one day and said, I have some news, I'm pregnant, the baby's not yours, and God is actually the father. Uh, You wouldn't believe it. And guess what? Joseph didn't believe it. When he was first told that news, if you go back and read the Christmas story, what you find out, he was making plans to secretly put Mary away somewhere so she could have the baby privately and there wouldn't be a lot of shame and that he was going to go his own way. He was going to call off the engagement, put Mary away, until God sent an angel to Joseph and said, the baby really is the Son of God and it's okay, Joseph, and we need you to take care of Mary. And Joseph trusted God, and he did that. Can you imagine the faith that Mary had to have when she realized that of all the women in the entire world, God chose to use her as the vehicle, as the instrument through whom he would bless the entire world? God's plans were so different than their plans, and they had to trust that God's plans were better, even though they were bigger and even though they were harder. They had to learn to trust God. Bible says there's only one way to please God and it's not religion and it's not ritual and it's not a bunch of regulations as a matter of fact look what we're told 
Without faith, it is impossible to please God. God wants you to learn to love him. We talk a lot about that in church. But this is equally important. God wants you to trust him. And every time God messes up your plans, it's a test. Are you going to trust me? Every time you thought life was going to zig, but instead it zagged, God's saying, this is a test. I want to know if you're going to trust me. Every time the unexpected, every time the disruption, every time it starts falling apart, God says, right now, this is a test. And I really want to know if you're going to trust me. Do you think I know better? Or do you think you know better? Do you think I know what's going to make you happy? Or do you want to be responsible for making you happy? This Christmas, you may be feeling a little discouraged. After the year we've had, a lot of people are feeling discouraged. 2020 has been a tough year for a lot of us. Or maybe today you're feeling a little lonely. You know, the isolation of the pandemic and the not seeing family or the not traveling and some of that, it's left a lot of people more lonely than ever at Christmas time. And Christmas can be one of the loneliest times on earth for a lot of people for a lot of reasons outside of COVID. You may be feeling stressed by it all, stressed by the holiday, stressed by other dynamics going on in your life. For some of you, it's the first Christmas since You've been divorced. For some of you, it's the first Christmas since you've lost a loved one. And I'm truly sorry about that. I I hurt with you, and I actually know those feelings. The truth were known. You're a little nervous about 2021. (laughs) I mean, after the year we've had, it's like, wow, what's coming next? We hear things about the economy like, well, There even be jobs, you know, or some of you are going to be unemployed uh, soon after the new year. Some people are facing evictions from their homes, and some people are, are, are facing food scarcity. And, I mean, the uncertainty of what's coming in 2021 has most of us a little unsettled. Is that marriage going to survive another year? Is that friendship going to survive? Are your kids going to do okay? You don't know what next year is going to bring, and neither do I. And that causes a lot of anxiety. But let me give you some assurance. In the middle of all we don't know, there are three things that we can know for sure. In 2021, God is still going to have a personal plan for your life. There's still going to be a reason for you to be you and for you to be here and for you to follow God because God has you here for his purposes. You were made by God and you were made for God. And once you understand that, everything else starts to make sense. And that's still going to be true next year. The second thing that will be true is you can know that God's never going to leave you. He didn't leave you in this terrible year. Like if ever there was a year, God would just throw up his hands and say, oh, that's too hard. I'm walking away. Too many bad things happening down there on earth. I'm walking away. If he was ever going to walk away, this would have been a year where we could have understood why. We wanted to walk away too. But God didn't walk away. He's been been with you every day of 2020, and he's going to be with you every day of 2021. The third thing you can know for sure is that ultimately the only legitimate rational way to live is to figure out who God is and to get to know him. God says, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. Did you know God wants you to be a seeker? In that very first Christmas story, the wise men were the first seekers. They weren't believers. Those wise men weren't Christians. They were just checking it out. They're just following the star, and they're trying to find out what it's all about. Some of you are like that, and that's great. You haven't yet given your life to Christ, but you're on the road. You're seeking the truth. There's nothing wrong with that, and I would say congratulations. We've all started out as seekers, but at some point, you have to become a believer. You have to step across the line. The whole point of your life is to get to the place where you began to have a relationship with Jesus, where you know he made you and he loves you and has a purpose for your life, and you love him, and then you begin to trust him with the direction and the details of your life. You say, well, isn't the purpose of my life happiness? No. 
Happiness is good, but that's not the purpose of your life. Well, I just want to find love in this world. Is it, is it wrong to want to be loved? No, it's not wrong to want to be loved. Love's a good thing. Love was created by God, but love is not the purpose of your life. I just want financial security. I just want freedom. I just want to get rid of these memories from my past that are bugging me. I want to be financially secure. I'm looking for peace of mind. All those things are fine. But do you know what you're really looking for? Beneath all of those other surface issues, what you really need is a relationship with God. And that is the purpose of your life. We are all wired up to have this need. God built in all of us a God-shaped hole that only God can fill. And if you try filling it with anything else, popularity, possessions, whatever, it's like putting a, a round peg in a square hole. It doesn't fit, and you know it. And you feel it, and it's frustrating. And just as God guided the wise men to find Jesus Christ, God guides seekers still. See, wise people still seek Christ. I don't care today what your religious background is, Catholic, Buddhist, Baptist, Mormon, Jewish. I really don't care about that. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about having a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm talking about learning to love him and learning to trust him. I don't know why you logged on today to be a part of our online experience here at Cal Church. Some of you say, well, it's the holiday season. I just want to get festive and I want to hear the Christmas music and all of that. That's cool. Some of you are here because somebody told you about our church or you saw something on social media and it intrigued you, so you logged on. Some of you watch online every week. You say, well, that's just my habit. I don't, I don't care why you think you're here. Here's what I know. God wanted you here today. God planned for you to be here today because God had something he wanted to say to you. God wanted to get your attention, and he wanted you to know that he made you. And he has a purpose for your life. And he loves you and you matter to him. And even though you may have been going off on your own plan, God is here inviting you to get with his plan. God's saying, I've seen every moment of your life. I knew you before you were even in your mother's womb. I saw your first heartbeat. I've seen the good, the bad, the ugly of your life. And God would be saying to you today, I still love you because I'm your God. For some of you, God would say, you know, it's been a while since we've been close. God would say that he's never moved. We're the ones that move away from him. And he would be inviting you to come back and be close to him. I have no doubt some of you know that God has been disrupting plans because he's been trying to get your attention for a long time now. And you're getting serious about that. You're beginning to give that some consideration. And you think, you know what, Brad, you're right. I'm tired of going my own way. It's time for me to get to know God and to learn to love him and to learn to trust him and Jesus Christ. Many of you today have already given your life to Jesus. You've given your heart to him. You've developed this relationship with God that we've talked about, and you are actively living out his purposes that he made you for. And what I'd say to you is just celebrate Christmas. Remember what a good deal it is that you got the day you gave your life to Christ. But for the rest, I'd say come home. Find your way. Seek him with all your heart, and God promises you will find him. And when you find him, he's not going to scold you. He's not going to berate you. He's not going to embarrass you. He's going to welcome you home with open arms. He doesn't want you to waste another second of your life separated from him. Today, we're going to close this service with a Christmas prayer, and I invite you to pray this prayer. Now listen, you don't have to close your eyes. You don't, you don't have to say these words out loud. You can say this in your heart because God knows you and God is with you right now. God can hear your heart. So what I want you to do, if you're ready to start this journey with Jesus and begin to live your life, the life God created you to live for Christ and with Christ in a relationship, I want you to pray this prayer with me. So right now, just say it in your heart. Dear God, thank you for being patient with me. 
I've always known you were there, but I've never really gotten to know you very well. I thank you for bringing me here today. I've known something was missing in my life. I just didn't know it was you. Thank you for seeking me even when I ignored you. Today I realize you've been trying to get my attention. I admit I've been focusing on my plan for life, not yours. I realize that you made me for a purpose. So today I want to take the first step by getting to know Jesus, who you sent at Christmas. Today, Jesus, as much as I know how, I want to open up my life to you. Please replace my guilt with your forgiveness. Replace my confusion with your peace. Replace my uncertainty about the future with the promise of your presence with me every day. This next year, I want to pay attention to you, God. I want to discover what you made me for. I want to learn to love you more, and I want to learn to trust you more. Help me with all of that as I begin this journey of faith. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.